ChatGPT, Dolly, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion. Most of us hadn't heard these names more than a couple of years ago, but these creative programs powered by artificial intelligence have taken the world by storm. Large language model AI programs can write stories and articles, make illustrations and artwork, and converse with users using prompts. But what does it mean for human artists and writers? Will AI steal jobs and creative works? How should people approach the thorny ethical thicket around AI-generated art? Welcome to Viewscapes, stories from Washington State Magazine, connecting you to Washington State University, the state, and the world. Hi, I'm Larry Clark, editor of the magazine. I met with philosopher Mark Fagiano at Washington State University about how ethics in action and pragmatism can help people examine issues not only in AI art, but any rapidly evolving technology in society. So if you could just introduce yourself. Sure. I'm Dr. Mark Fajano. I work here as professor in uh, ethics and philosophy, and I focus on areas of uh, 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 pragmatism mostly and writing on uh, empathy, race now, and democracy. That's great. And I contacted you because I've mm. become really fascinated with AI. Yeah. And in particular, AI generating art, mm. writing articles. Yeah. But that opens a whole can of worms when it comes mm. to uh, ethics sure. and some ethical dilemmas. So mm. I'm hoping to learn some from you and maybe talk and converse a bit about what is AI. Mm. You know, is it actually generating things? Mm. And is AI really intelligent? Yeah. Uh, that's very interesting. I think also we might want to have to define what we mean by ethics as well. <laughs> and uh, so sure. my loyalties, and there's different schools of thought, but my loyalties go back to the ancient Greeks and the notion of ethos that signifies character or ethicos that means related to a character. So one develops a character f by repeatedly doing something. And by repeatedly doing some activity, that leads to a certain sort of flourishing or, or um, excellence of the action. And so for someone like Aristotle, he'd say, well, that seems like uh, we all strive towards that more for itself to be flourishing, to do well in life. Um, and then, of course, there's different schools of ethics where it's more following certain rules or principles, following reason or in, in line with reason. And then more of the school I'm from, too, in addition to and, and, and being enamored by the Greeks is American pragmatism. So mostly William James and, and Dewey. In terms of uh, my own thoughts now, I really think that sometimes um, <clears throat> ethics has to be done on the fly <laughs> to some extent. And that's kind of echoing what William James said. And I wish I was brilliant enough to say this, but you can't really have an ethics made up dogmatically, that's the key word, in advance of experience. So when more e more experience arises, then there's more reflection and more of an, an ethical engagement with these transformations that are happening in society and our own lives and such like that. So those are some of my loyalties with sure. the notion. So it's ethics in action mm, is something yeah. that's developed. Right. And the difficulty with that, I think that ethics is probably, <laughs> maybe this because of what I do, or maybe I don't want to make it sound more difficult than it is, but you know, it's, life is complicated and trying to figure out what it even means to flourish and do well. And then if I'm flourishing and doing well and at the ex exclusion of another person being able to do well, is that ethical? <laughs> so there's all these questions re regarding ourselves and what it means to do well and flourish. And then there is the relations between ourselves and other people and community at large. So it's very difficult uh, topics that come up. And so I think like one of the things that happens is that people just try to create these rules <laughs> and then say, hey, this is ethics, just follow the rules. Well, you know, I don't like that so much because it doesn't involve very much active participation and reflection upon the difficulty, you know, of making decisions, you know, with all these changes that are happening. What's the good? What's the right thing to do? These, I think that this it's really resolved in making sure we're having discussions like this and have, creating opportunities institutionally to have those types of discussion with the community at large. Yeah, I and I think this really applies to to this conversation about AI and what mm. it's what it's starting to do mm -hmm. um, in the world of art yeah. and creative expression mm -hmm. and writing. 
I mean, I don't even know if I should call it creative expression. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. So, you know, <clears throat> um, a couple of things about AI. I guess maybe to start with is a uh, there is a flaw. There's a philosopher, um, uh, John Searle, who came up with this uh, example called the Chinese Room Argument. And in the Chinese Room Argument, you can just imagine somebody's uh, in like a box, sort of like this room here, and the person doesn't speak or understand any Chinese. But somebody from the outside who does speak Chinese uh, is handing the person certain little characters, characters and numbers on them with Chinese script on it. And then there's a book in the room for the person who doesn't understand Chinese. And there's rules to say, hey, put these in a certain order. Hmm. So the person hands the tiles. The person doesn't know what they The person inside the room doesn't know what's said in there, but they follow the rule book and then put them in a certain order and then they hand it out to the person who speaks Chinese. And so what happens is basically there's a question asked by the person outside and then there's an answer that the person constructs in the room, hands it back out. The person's like, oh, the person gets it. Well, no, of course they don't. They're just following the rule or algorithm or the pattern, right, mm-hmm. to, to arrange it a certain way. And so, like, this is this is really important because this is a long time ago. This was actually thought up uh, by this philosopher and others. Uh, and it just basically is saying, like, look, um, there's different types of AI. Like, one of the ways we think of AI in that term is just called weak AI. Like, okay, an artificial intelligent robot or computer could arrange certain things in a certain way, but it doesn't really know it, right? Yeah. Uh, but then there's an idea called strong AI, and we see that in, like, the scary movies, that the AI is going to come and get us. Skynet. Can they? Yeah. From yeah. Terminator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll be back. Sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> and so the idea is, you know, okay, so what will happen? Now, now in artificial intelligence, there are these layers right down to machine learning, now deep learning. So some people think, like, in the area of deep learning, it might be the case where there is that strong AI, but I'm pretty skeptical about that at the moment, but, you know, we'll see. Besides all that, I mean, some of the things that can be done, like, for instance, diagnosing cancer early more than any doctor, it's amazing. Yeah. So if you have enough inputs in this and there's in the deeper levels of AI, there can be amazing things done. <laughs> um, question is, the big ethical question is, who is... Um, experiencing any sort of value from it and who's being excluded ethically as far as the ability to flourish, which probably brings us to the question of, you know, artists. I mean, here are people who dedicate their lives to become digital artists, and now this is arising. Uh, This has happened a lot of times historically where a new technology, I think it's early 1900s, you know, uh, the steam engine or whatever it might have been, (laughs) comes around, oh, no, there, there goes all the jobs, how terrible this is. Well, it's, you know, it, this is the sort of thing that happens, so we can't be too uh, worried about the fact that there's going to be technologies that are, and especially in the next 10 and 20 years, a lot of jobs are getting going to be lost. A lot of people are going to have to shift uh, their focus. I think if people want to shift their focus to be practical about, you know, having a job, right, then I would think, like, they want to think about, like, what could I do that would involve something an AI computer can't do? <laughs> like, for instance, uh, be creative in a certain way or to be skeptical or to have emotions. You know, people talk about, well, an AI computer can can mimic an emotion. But really? I mean, no, they're not experiencing emotion. Emotions our evolved characteristics that we have, that we're moved, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, what is the thing a computer can't do? I really feel sad for the folks that have spent their lives, you know, trying to create beautiful things for people. The problem is, is that most jobs like that, that are subservient to a capitalist society or some sort, you know, to, to be subservient to some sort of commercialization are probably going to be. Uh, made useless, and I put, I'm showing scare quotes here. We can't, yeah. can't see. <laughs> made useless in the sense of not being uh, able to fulfill the needs in a capitalist society. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's one of the things that I've heard and read quite a bit about. You know, mm. these artists who feel like they are being impinged on yeah. by this commercial tool, mm-hmm. which is essentially what it is. Yeah. You know, anybody can get onto one of these art generation AIs mm-hmm. um, and like stable diffusion and mm. put in some some yeah. prompts and it'll create right. artwork. Yeah. For lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, kind of going back to what you were talking about, you know, 
people flourishing? You know, mm-hmm. what is it, you know, that, that what actions are, are happening that will either help them or harm them? Right. And they're claiming that they're getting harmed. Yes, they are. I'm sure they are. But, uh, you know, they're not. I mean, so one of the ideas is like, well, maybe they should. I mean, we can't have like an AI com- company say, OK, well, you've been harmed. So here's money. <laughs> I mean, I just did not think that's going to happen. They are being harmed. Um, the question is, is that, you know, what can one do about it? Mm. And I don't know if mu- one can do much. Um, I would say maybe try to focus on art that's more disruptive and can't be copied. And, and so that involves another thing that AI can't do is these higher imaginative um, explorations of the mind. And so like an AI can't have a mind's eye. You know, if you close your eyes, you can see like I can see outside in the, the rain and I can imagine a Newton, Isaac Newton walking across here if I wanted to. Those sorts of things can't aren't part of an AI right. machine. So what sort of ways in which that could lead to certain creativity and imagination? So I think one of the big questions for us today is to think about what are diff- what's different from humans and, 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 and AI machines. And there are a lot of things that are different. And so if people really want to focus on the more pragmatic, like I may get a job that's not going to be overtaken by the computer, I'd say focusing on those things. I say sometimes as a joke, like maybe philosophers will be the only ones left now <laughs> because they just doubt things, you know? Right. So, <laughs> that might be advantageous, but I mean, and with every bad thing, it's clearly harm, but there's also going to be a lot of positive things, like the energy someone feels, oh, wow, look at I just put my 10 pictures, like there's one called Lenza, you put like 10 or 15 uh, of, of, of selfies into the app, and it just gives you all these cool pictures of yourself, and so that brings a lot of joy, so that's not harmful, right? But then, it's, you know, it's an exchange here. Uh, so there's always, you know, with different sorts of things like this, with harm, there's also uh, ease of use and there's also certain joys that happen. So that's just part of the nature of reality. <laughs> yeah. Is there some other aspect around identifying what is an AI, say, written article mm-hmm. or an AI generated artwork? Mm-hmm. You know, is there some compelling need for people to identify, hey, you know, this was done by a deep language learning model, Mm. um, as opposed to, you know, just putting it out there. Does it need to be credited to an AI? Uh, Yeah. Hmm. Because, I mean, this came up recently, I forget which uh, news outlet, but Mm -hmm. they said, oh, you know, you know, we've been generating these AI articles for a while. Yeah. And I know for a fact that, um, for example, sports wraps uh, uh, recaps are often written by AI. Right. Yeah. Should they be identified that way? Mm, that's a big question. I think the lawyers will have to deal with that one. <laughs> but, but I do think that uh, my own experience of chat, and this chat GPT is just the first, you know, really good one. Yeah. It's going to get more intense and we'll see what happens. And again, this is the whole point of ethics. You can't, here comes experience. It's rushing in. Now let's reflect. <laughs> I... Um, I don't think that, uh, I think at the school or any other school, sometimes the first initial sense is like, okay, we don't trust the students, they're going to use this, and we're, how do we make sure that we're grading them, right, uh, that they're not cheating and stuff like this. You can't try to censor things and have a hands-off position. Now, of course, you can you, you can say you can't use this, and you can ban it from the school, which I think we have. I don't know. Maybe we haven't. But I understand that. But then, you, just again, then ethically, the question is, how do you create things that can't be and the student can't use that. Um, I've used it for summaries of things. And what I've noticed is the problem is it's, first of all, a lot of the first sentences are just throwaway sentences. So it's not very engaging mm-hmm. um, just in terms of the writing. And a lot of times it's wrong. And I'm sure it'll get better and better. Um, but the great thing about uh, writing is that it's never just, just an explanatory venture where I'm just explaining what something is. And that's, I think, what AI can do well. Question is, like, what now is the significance of those those facts? Mm -hmm. And where do we go from here? Or what do we do based on the facts? And then there's the the interpretive dynamic, which in AI is not uh, subject to hermeneutical differences in the same way as a human could be. And they're not influenced by same cultural biases and loyalties and things like that. So another thing, in addition to emotions and skepticism, is interpretation, right, yeah. <laughs> of text and of meaning. 
Um, so yeah, maybe philosophers and hermeneuticists will be the only ones left standing <laughs> as a job. And that'd be terrible. Then philosophers have to work while well, everybody else gets UBI, <laughs> you know, um, which might happen. You know, I, I could yeah. see, I could see like, you know, unemployment going to 30, 40 percent. And then and UBI being, being UBI. universal basic income. Yes. So yeah, I think that's going to happen. That, yeah. Not in every society, but I think it's going to happen. It's not going to be happen because the government just loves you so much and just wants you to be okay. It's going to be like to prevent a lot of times when there's any sort of welfare or anything uh, where there's free money given to citizens just so they don't uprise. I mean, it's, it's not going to be an uprising, you know. And so that's fine, you know, but yeah. it still will be a lot more limited, you know, as far as what you can do. So I think just in terms of the future, it's just who, we don't know what's going to happen, but I think it's going to be the next 10 years will be something you never expect. I mean, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be, it's going to be frightening and it's going to be amazing, but it's not going to be frightening in the way people think Mm -hmm. with like the robots taking over. The robots are already taking over in the sense they're being used as weapons in a certain way, you know? Mm -hmm. So humans are very much using AI in maybe practical, but also somewhat uh, malevolent ways uh, for their own purposes and for certain sorts of um, warfare, which I think will get even, I mean, it's hard to say what, what the, the future of that is, but, you know, in terms of the whole idea of the narrative, like, will they take over? Well, it's already happening in a certain way yeah. <laughs> and it's being used and directed by human beings for their own interests and stuff. I think it's um, people's response to AI has mm. really been fascinating to me. Yeah. You know, this so. panic we were talking about, mm. you know, of, you know, oh, they're going to take my, you know, the AI is taking my job or yeah. it's destroying this particular field, say art mm-hmm. or writing. Um, I think this is really fascinating. And I read a piece in Wired mm. that gave me a very different look at it. Mm. You know, talked about photography mm. and how when photography came out, there were a lot of people who said, this is the end of art as we know it. Mm-hmm. You know, there will be no more artists. Yeah. Well, what was interesting is that there were more artists after photography That's came out. They right? came in, they yes. came in demand. Wow. So I wonder huh. if something similar is going to happen with AI. It's sure yeah. it's a disruptor. Mm-hmm. But you mentioned and I I love this mm. this idea of doing some art that's more daring. More daring and and this is a huge no, I don't want to go into like my theory of aesthetics, but this is something that has been discussed historically as to like what is the nature of art? Are there certain types of art? And there's any sort of hierarchy? You know, democratic society, people say, well, the art is just the feeling of what it causes in you. But then there is a state of like how who's judging whether it's daring or not and disruptive. But you know, in terms again, I just can't help but think like in line with like Adorno and a lot of the critical theorists in terms of. When it's subservient to a capitalist society or it's subservient to certain interests of some commercial project, it's already limited as far as being disruptive. Just like in an interview, like maybe if we had an interview, just you and me talking versus if I'm on NBC, there are some things I couldn't say there, you know, because it's not brought to you by Taco Bell. (laughs) Well, in the same way, you know, that that that's, that's very similar to what I just said, namely that. You know, when you are subject to the the marketplace, uh, there are limitations to the creative act. Mm. So I would like, yeah, I think like a lot of people, the sky is falling. They have the feeling the sky is falling. Yeah. But I think you're right in terms of you just don't know. You know, and, and the photography examples is perfect, how there were more photographers. I mean, I know for myself when... You know, the, I, I never got into the room with the, what do you call the, the you know, the, the dark room. The dark room. Yeah. I never got into that. But, you know, I really enjoyed when I got a phone and could, like, take pictures of things I saw. Mm-hmm. And look how that exploded to a lot of, you know, just people sharing a lot of beautiful things that they see, uh, which is nice. And then also a little bit obsessive <laughs> in certain contexts. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's hard to know where things are going to go. I, yeah, and the most, the biggest concern I have is the unchecked use of AI for certain power to have to give advantage to some people and to forget so many others, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, like, with things that are going to be advanced with, like, different sorts of things that can go into the brain, I mean, who's going to have access to that? What sort of laws are going to be created to protect 
the vulnerable. Right. And that's the big thing I think we really have to worry about. How will AI or the use of some sort of neural link of things people want to put into the brain or whatever? I mean, already just having access to an internet is way advantageous for people who have it compared to like um, the global south. So that's the big thing. We, and that needs to be something where power is really checked. And if it doesn't happen, then you're going to have a lot of bad consequences. And I'm, you know, a conse- as a pragmatist, I'm a consequentialist. I'm worried about, okay, let's think about this. This doesn't, it doesn't really have moral value in and of itself. It has produces things which produce harm or pleasure, as you said before, which is a great way of thinking about it ethically, I think, in terms of what harm not only is existing now, but what harm may be created if we don't really think carefully about this. Yeah, I could see some real danger of using AI as a tool of control, yes, which yeah. is <laughs> probably very tempting, sure. you know, and especially in authoritarian mm-hmm. uh, governments and and places where they gain advantage from Mm -hmm. controlling people. And even today with, you know, our online presence or the phones, you know, it's Mm -hmm. basically cookies are tracking us. And then, you know, it's a tor it's a type of intelligence in the sense of like an ordering of trying to sell us more things based on likes. Now that might be very advantageous. I'll tell you a story. Uh, I went on, (laughs) it's a weird one, you know, I didn't make it up. I went on Google and went, uh, you know, Walt Whitman T-shirt. I wanted to get a Walt Whitman T-shirt. Never had sure. one, you know, be cool teacher. Hey, look at him, Walt Whitman T-shirt, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. Captain my captain. So I did that. And then a day later on Facebook, on the side, it said, buy your Walt Whitman T-shirt. So, I mean, like, yeah, you knew yes. that was it. And no one's going to freaking look up Walt Whitman T-shirt so you know it was tracking. So these things are already being used. And then there's the moral question, like, if you want to commit your life to just doing that sort of thing where you're following people and trying to sell them, that's... That's your choice, but it's like it's manipulative. And people can, in our culture, you know, people praise the almighty dollar, but at what cost? By manipulating people's choices? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's going to become more of a problem where AI or other forms of computer interfaces will be able to, again, be subservient to a marketplace. Yeah, and, and there's no escaping it. I'm not a, a Marxist, all right. Although I can understand like what Marx is saying in 1844 economic manuscripts and the problems he sees, which are manifested in different ways today, you know. But at the same time, you know, it's just we need to be vigilant. And yeah, and no, digital I, privacy. I think that's a really oh fascinating yeah. uh, point. You know, where mm-hmm. machine learning and AI is just going to accelerate that. Yes, because yes. one of the things that I understand. AI is very good at is making those connections, Mm -hmm. you know, pulling those threads of information and intelligence and Mm -hmm. creating ways to reach consumers. Again, it's a form of control. It's a form of control. And there's no way, again, going back to James, to have an ethical, an ethics made up dogmatically in advance of experience as we need to be vigilant as experiences come in. As now we're having this discussion and being reflective upon uh, these different um, developments. Uh, and so that's the key. Like, I think too much that ethics in at least how people practice it is too much in line with compliance and not enough thinking about the emerging things that are happening and reflection and vigilance towards those emerging things <laughs> versus like, because the rules won't catch up by themselves. <laughs> and not that you'd have to make necessarily new <laughs> rules, but you have to have some reflection and analysis of these emerging uh, phenomena in relationship to harm and pleasure and these sorts of things. All of this does relate to just the, the future of education as well. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. educate, creating educated citizens in the way so that they can analyze and think about these developments and come together, uh, 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 you know, to uh, make collective decisions for their community and for the nation. Mm-hmm. And, and this is, so that's very much involved. Like if people stand up and say, in certain aspects of AI tech, people stand up and say no to it if they see the harm. That's the power, you know, of mm-hmm. democratic of democratic ideal. That's a democratic ideal. So, I, you know, I guess the answer, the thing to say is just <laughs> wait and see and just um, keep seeing how things come in. Keep the lines of communication. It's all part of an open society. Mm-hmm. Keeping lines of communication, inviting people, being inclusive to think about these things. Because the more people that know about the harms, the more the less chances that in the future it's going to cause those harms. But like we said before about with this whole situation with with the artists, it's just 
I feel real badly because especially for an artist, you know, it's like a warm place in our soul. Like people who are artistic, you know, trying yeah. to create beauty, it's just really tragic. But I don't know what can be done about it. Well, I think you outlined some ways of thinking about it, though, you know, in terms of ethics being something that you you don't just have rules for. Yeah. I don't know if you use the term legalist legalistic but <laughs> yeah. that's what you know, jumps to my mind no, that's great. as opposed yeah. to that yeah it's something that's practiced mm -hmm. and that we right. have to constantly work on and we make mistakes you know that the certainty of the rule allows us to think like well you know i'm not going to have blame for any experimental idea that i where i make a mistake so there's a security and there's a safety to the rules and the rules too beyond that i'm not just saying it's a psychological phenomenon they they serve certain interests and they do keep things together especially in an institution mm -hmm. however you know at what cost if it's too if it's only that is there anything else that you know people could think about mm. you know as ai starts moving beyond just like writing and art and starts you yeah. know, impacting our lives in different ways yeah is there is there a practical way for them to use this ethics of action yeah. or actionable ethics yeah stay informed stay informed and engage if you see things emerging and that's part of being in, in participating in society um, and then also back to what I said before about those things, <laughs> I don't want everybody to go out there and say, oh, everybody go study AI and what it can't do, but you know, what can't and I, what will my AI machine never be able to do? And what's the difference between, if you're thinking about charting your future or career, what's the sort of things that a human can do and an AI machine can't do? And I think like the divine process of being skeptical about some things <laughs> is one of them, you know, and, and being emotionally moved you know, when you see somebody in pain or have harm, right? Those are the sorts of things that I don't know. If, who knows what's going to happen, though? I could yeah. be totally wrong. We could listen back on this in five years and go, oh, gosh, now we have. <laughs> but I just don't think it's possible with those sorts of things. And then also with interpretation and different types of interpretation or different sorts of imagining, right? Mm -hmm. And just trust yourself to imagine things, you know, and to have that that time alone, you know, to be in solitude and to imagine your future and your life and to, to create it from those, uh, those activities. Yeah. I think that that's a big piece of what makes us human. Yeah. And, and we should always engage in that. Sure. Sure. And I do want, um, listeners to know that none of this was done by AI. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I do have a, a neural link in my brain. <laughs> this is uh, brought to you not by AI, but it has been brought to you by Taco Bell. Now. <laughs> well, great. Thanks great. so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thanks for listening to Viewscapes. You can read about AI and how researchers are measuring its capabilities in the spring 2023 issue at magazine.wsu.edu. Our music was composed by WSU Emeritus Professor Greg Yazanitsky.